Well, as you know, I've been droning on about unmanned uh, aerial vehicles for a while. Now, I'm addicted to drones, quadcopters or whatever. But I know that uh, not only my enjoyment, but some commercial applications of these flying machines depends entirely on the delivery of safety. Nothing's worth doing if you can't doing it, do it safely. And uh, the people who look after our air safety are CASA. I'm really delighted that Peter Gibson's uh, on the line at the moment. G'day, Peter. You've been a busy man. Well, indeed. Drones are taking up a fair bit of time at the moment with uh, some uh, new rule changes and, of course, just the whole explosion in the number of people both recreationally and commercially uh, operating drones. I don't think uh, the wider community has uh, got its head around how many drones are out there of all different sizes. I mean, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people here in Australia flying drones hooked up on social media. And uh, it's really surprised me the wonderful applications, apart from hobbying, uh, that have come out. And it's really important as we wait, Peter, I guess, for the Senate review, that we have a look at some of the things that exist in the new regulations. And you've been pretty busy uh, helping people navigate their way through it. Well, we have. And uh, to date, um, we've had over a 1,000 people fill in the notification form on our website for the uh, under two kilogram commercial category, which is the new category of uh, commercial operations. So that's, I think, 1,100 people have indicated to us they're uh, either going to or considering operating in that uh, new category. So that's a huge number. In and it's actually a bit um, over a week. that plus one because I'm doing the same. <laughs> well, there you go, yeah. And that's in just over a week. It's uh, only about, what, 10 days or so since that new category started and already that huge number of people. Well, I tell you what, there is the potential to melt down the website with the, the growing interest and as people get on board. And I just wanted to clarify a few things. So I've got a bunch of dumb questions from people online and from 6PR, Peter. And I'll start off with the important definition and difference between flying as a hobbyist and flying commercially. Now, obviously, if you're getting paid to shoot video or do some surveillance or surveying, that's commercial, but I don't think many people understand that if you shoot video, even if you're a hobbyist, and you get money from it on YouTube, you may, in some cases, be considered commercial. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, fly your drone, uh, you know, out the coast somewhere and get some nice pictures of um, beaches or, uh, you know, whatever, dolphins in the surf or whatever, um, if you do that uh, purely for your own enjoyment, uh, post that somewhere and someone comes along to you and says, hey, I'd really like to buy those pictures off you, Look, as a one-off, we're not going to consider you commercial because you didn't shoot that with the intention of being commercial. You've just been lucky enough that someone wants to buy it. But, of course, if you then go and do that regularly, regularly shoot uh, vision and regularly sell it to someone else, well, then, yes, you're getting into the commercial territory. So it's really the intention of when you go and fly the drone and take the pictures or do whatever you're doing. What is your intention at the time? If your intention is to make money, you're commercial. If your intention is just, just to have fun, naturally, you're recreational. Now, obviously, you're restructuring for a huge task ahead. I wanted to find out, too, um, um, obviously, CAS is going to have to need some new resources for people to inspect uh, uh, complaints to go out and do some field work, etc. Um, there's a lot to do. Has CAS got a, an overall plan to Absolutely. We are uh, moving to get some more inspectors so that we can get people out in the field. Uh, if we have multiple complaints about one location or one person or one operator, then obviously we can get out and have a look at that. So, yeah, we're ramping up our efforts to make sure that uh, people do the right thing. Uh, but, you know, really, we, we largely rely uh, upon people understanding the rules and following them using their common sense, that they don't want to hurt people, they don't want to cause an, an aircraft to crash, so therefore follow the rules. Yeah, and the good thing and the good news for you and uh, CASA is that there is emerging a culture amongst Australian flyers of all ages and backgrounds 
uh, of safety and promoting safety because everyone I've spoken to online and on air is really keen to address safety so they can then uh, enjoy their hobbying or their commercial efforts up in the air. And um, I guess it's really important for everyone listening, even if you haven't got one of those bigger things and you think yours is a little toy, I guess probably the most important message for all of us uh, to get out is that at emergency scenes, if it's a a fire or a crash or whatever, um, keep your drone out of there because you're likely to do more harm than good. And uh, I guess that's a really important thing. Keeping away from uh, airports and airstrips, uh, was it a five point five or six kilometre exclusion zone. Um, there's some common sense we can apply, isn't isn't there? Yeah, there really is. I mean, the rules are in the civil aviation safety regulations set out in legalese, but you're right, you can bring it back to common sense. What do you want to avoid? You want to avoid colliding with people. So one of the rules is no closer than 30 metres to other people. And also another rule is don't fly over crowds or groups of people. You want to avoid uh, colliding with uh, aircraft because you might cause a mid-air collision. So the rules say stay five and a half kilometres away from major airports, stay under 400 feet and always uh, ground your drone if you see aircraft flying around you at a low level. So if you see a helicopter going to a to um, you know an emergency situation or a helipad at a hospital and you're flying your drone nearby ground your drone. So they are really common sense rules uh, to just avoid hurting people on the ground or uh, causing mid-air collisions. Yeah, indeed. And uh, there is great potential for uh, private quad owners uh, to assist the emergency services. And uh, a few of us are working on a plan to get a a pool of volunteer pilots who are properly qualified to support uh, fire, police and ambulance and uh, bushfire volunteers as well. There's a lot of um, potential for doing good. I've been absolutely freaked out about how drones are being used around the world, but I am absolutely scared, like a lot of people, including Nick Xenophon, that a lot of people with no experience at uh, remote control never have flown a drone by stick before, in in other words, manually, are getting these uh, so-called automatic selfie drones, and they have no idea, after they fire this thing up and put it up into the sky, what to do if it doesn't behave as described. And uh, I think we've all got a lot of work to do there. Well, yeah, and and if you go back to the origins of uh, model aircraft originally, which morphed into drones, um, you know, they formed clubs and people got together to learn about these things, learn about how to fly them and how to build them and maintain them and so forth. And while uh, obviously drones have gone too far across the community to be all run by clubs now, I think people getting together and sharing their knowledge and sharing their information, uh, whether it's physically or via social media, is a really, really good idea so that people can uh, learn a bit before they do stick their drone up in the skies because you've got to understand and you've you've said it that if you even if you're only flying quite a small cheap drone you're in the skies and therefore there are a set of risks come with that and it's your responsibility to manage those risks safely you know risks like hitting someone or running into an aircraft or damaging someone's property and you've got to manage those risks and the way to do that of course is follow the rules and as you say also very importantly do a bit of training. You know, if, if, if you're not sure how to fly your drone properly, find someone online who is, get them to help you with some advice or, you know, search for it um, so that you are proficient in controlling your drone, whether it's a tiny little $100 one or worth uh, 5000 Absolutely. And um, there are lots of uh, free uh, teaching videos on basic uh, quadcopter and drone flying for beginners. It's free and you'd be nuts not to go and do it. I'll be sending out some uh, training and safety videos that I've uh, used and recommend. And I'll also, Peter, let our listeners know that if they uh, are on Twitter or Instagram, if they want to get some updates on safety, CASA rules and training, they can uh, follow me at Drone Rangers. You have the at sign and Drone Rangers on Twitter and Instagram. But um, going to the CASA website, which is consistently updated, there's really good graphics there. And there's also, for those uh, um, absolute FPV and quad nuts out there who want to make a difference on safety, you're actually encouraging uh, community groups to uh, promote safety at their uh, group events and things like that, and you're prepared to support them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the, the drone racing stuff... Um 
can be done under the auspices of uh, the Model Aircraft Association of Australia or any other approved association that we uh, give an approval to. So we're certainly not out to stop people doing uh, FPV drone racing, but of course it has to be done in a controlled way because quite clearly there are some self-evident risks uh, um, that are attached to uh, flying very fast around a course <clears throat> if there are other people around. So, um, so, but yeah, but certainly we look. We want overall. We want to encourage people at the recreational level to have fun with their drones. We want to encourage the commercial uh, drone industry, which is now its own sector of the aviation uh, industry, uh, to continue to grow and offer more and more uh, services, particularly as technology improves. So we're doing everything we can to try to keep the rules uh, up moving along to up to date with uh, the way technology and use is changing uh, and to meet the needs of uh, everyone out there. Now, if it's all right, Peter, um, I've spoken to you off air about this, but I'd be really happy if we could do uh, some ongoing talks to really flesh out the uh, rights and responsibilities in the new regs as it's being reviewed. Lots of questions from uh, people online and on air. Uh, One I I wanted to ask ahead of uh, more opportunities down the track to cover more detail is... um, does the nighttime ban on flying um, UAVs apply to all areas or just public space? Like, if I go down to an empty park at two o'clock in the morning for a quick fly, am I doing a wrong thing? Yeah, look, nighttime operations are not allowed unless you're a commercial operator. Uh, who's been given a permission by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority to do that. So you can come to us as a commercial operator uh, and say, look, this is what I want to do, this is how I'm going to manage all the risks, and we can approve that. Um, But if you're a recreational flyer, uh, no, you can't, once again, unless you're doing it as part of the uh, Model Aircraft Association of Australia. They have got some procedures in place for that sort of thing, but certainly don't encourage individuals or groups of people that are outside of either of those two categories to fly at night, again, because of the obvious risks if you can't see what's around you properly and therefore you, uh, you know, there is an increased risk of uh, causing uh, injury or damage. All right, I think uh, that's going to be looked at a bit more closely and I wanted to think about it too, like if I go out, I've got a a range of uh, little machines, if I go out in my backyard at night and fly around in those confines, I tend to think instinctively, oh, that can't cause any harm. But then I've got to be honest, Peter, I think of the how easy it is to have a flyaway and what can happen with a couple of pounds of metal up in the air. Uh, I do think twice. Yeah, well, I think, look, that's the point. That's right. I mean, on the face of it, your own backyard at night, well, what's going to happen? But, 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 as you rightly say, if you get a flyaway and your drone suddenly heading across the road or across the fence and two fences away, you know, two blocks away, there's a party with, you know, 50 people in the backyard enjoying themselves and your drone plows into it, we've got a real problem. So, you know, that's, that's why, uh, you know, that's why you've got, you've, you know, that's why those sorts of rules are there. I think, too, we have to be honest about it, and those of us who like the thrill and the adrenaline of uh, flying as first person or by line of sight, we're generally uh, high adrenaline risk taker sort of people, and quite often uh, that uh, cohort can uh, ignore the rules or say, no, look, I- I'm really good at this, I don't have to worry about that, but we do need to check ourselves, don't we? Oh, absolutely. Look, and look, flying a drone is just a, uh, you know, another version of being a pilot. Um, you know, in this case, obviously, you're flying a less, you know, in a different environment than a pilot who's flying up in the sky. But it's got all the responsibilities of that, of understanding your equipment, understanding the environment you're flying in, understanding the risks, and following the appropriate rules to manage all those risks. So, yeah, it very, look, it very much is. You've got to think about yourself as, you know, a pilot in the sky albeit with a machine which is up there and you're down on the ground but there's a whole bunch of responsibilities go with that and if you bring that mindset to it hey as I say we want people to have fun we want people to run successful drone businesses but we also need to just make sure that uh, you know people aren't injured or uh, aircraft aren't, uh, aren't damaged. Yeah, this isn't a small thing. This is a monumental change to transport in the whole world, uh, probably of the magnitude of the car replacing the horse. And as we'll remember, Peter, they, they used to have to have a man holding a red flag walking in front of the first cars. I think we're just ahead of that stage for understanding that the airspace around us has suddenly become a... Uh, uh, a passageway, and we're going to have to regulate and think about how we use it. 
Already in America, I understand Intel has been granted special permission by the FAA to fly uh, multiple quads in certain channels even at night. And we really are looking at uh, the formation of new regulations for airspace around the world, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. And the, the, the goal of all regulators and the International Civil Aviation Organization is to integrate uh, drones into the manned aviation uh, environment. So in other words, share the same airspace, um, be that controlled airspace or uncontrolled airspace, so that you know, in a few years' time, and it probably isn't that many years ahead, you'd be able to have unmanned aircraft you know, flying between Perth and, uh, and Broome, say, carrying freight at night or whenever, uh, sharing the same airspace as you know a passenger aircraft uh, uh, flying the same sort of route. So I mean that's the aim. That's what everyone's working towards. People can see that day is coming. It's absolutely certain that's coming, and that's at the top end, the big scale, right down to you know smaller drones as we know them today, sharing uh, sharing the airspace um, around cities and and major towns as well. Now the technology's still got a bit of way to go in terms of. Uh, the drones being able to sense what's around them and avoid things, and you know, work out how to avoid things. But that, you know, there's some big, big, big money being put into this right around the world by some very large companies, and uh, all those things will be overcome, of course. And it's just a matter of scaling it down to an affordable level. And as you say, you suddenly then see a whole change in in aviation and the way we uh, approach it. Already there are companies out there, helicopter companies out there, for example, who have got into the drone area because they can see that drones are going to eat into the traditional business of helicopters in survey work or aerial photography and that sort of thing. So, you know, they've put another wing on their business to say, well, we're into drones. And uh, the, it's going to the happen training, more and more. the training industry is growing absolutely exponentially too, and that's going to be very important for everyone. And uh, good luck to those uh, who are setting up and who are building on existing and long-standing uh, training programs it is quite expensive, as some people might say, to um, get a license and spend maybe a minimum of five days in theory and practical. But I think when you look at it, it's well worth it, the potential to earn. And what you learn is such a valuable skill and what's going to be a huge industry. Peter, already um, over in Africa there, they're using Africa because of its lack of regulation for a lot of testing. I was reading this morning uh, about in Rwanda, of all places, they're delivering blood to remote hospitals by uh, drones with a 25-mile uh, range. And a lot of the sort of things that we're facing in our larger communities are being pretty much field tested in Africa as we speak. Yeah, well, you can see the attraction of that. They've got poor road infrastructure or you know, non-existent rail infrastructure. So here's a solution suddenly that you can get those distances. And it doesn't matter what's on the ground, if it's a flood or whatever. And indeed, here in Australia, the floods in uh, eastern Australia recently, um, you know, a number of property owners said the only way they could get out to see what was going on across the other side of their property, whether the stock were OK or whether the fences had been washed away or whatever, to launch a drone because they couldn't drive across the paddocks because they were just so wet they'd sink in. So already you're starting to see that being used and we're just at the tip of the iceberg now. This is going to grow and grow and grow and, uh, and become more sophisticated in the years to come. Oh, absolutely. And right now we've had some massive fires over a million hectares burn out in the far north of the state in areas of limited access. And I'm looking forward to the day when we have uh, politicians who are clever, clever enough to uh, provide some funding to train uh, drone operators for every uh, country volunteer firefighting authority. And I reckon that's going to happen pretty soon, mate, because um, this is growing well and it deserves attention and support. Oh, well, I mean, you can see the advantage there. You know, if you're in a rural bushfire brigade uh, and you've got a fire in your area and it's really hard because of the terrain to work out the size of it and the nature of it, if you've got to wait for a helicopter to arrive, you know, depending on where you are, it can be anywhere from half an hour to hours because the helicopter's obviously based somewhere else. And uh, and the fire, of course, is burning in that uh, stage. If you've got a drone in your at your brigade with qualified people to fly it, up you go, You've got the photographs, you've got the data you need. To you make can also successful. drop off things like uh, a little walkie-talkie or other comms. You can drop in a bottle of water. Uh, and um, the, the potential we've already seen being exploited and, and life-saving overseas, to me, is the most exciting. Mm. Oh, absolutely. And uh, indeed, the, uh, the drone uh, Outback Challenge that was uh, held in... Uh, Queensland recently, um, the the, the uh, test they do for that challenge now, the uh, 
the exercise they do for that challenge is indeed um, going out to someone who's stranded in inverted commas uh, with an injury. Um, the drone drops off, I, th I think, I'm, I can't remember this exactly now, but I think they dropped off some, a medical kit to take a blood sample. Uh, so the person who takes a blood sample, puts it on the drone, the drone takes that back to uh, a doctor nearby somewhere, but you know, with no land access. Um, an assessment's done, and the drone takes back the drugs or treatment or whatever it is for that for that injured person. So you know that was a, an exercise being done as part of a competition recently, um, but that's showing where people are thinking about exactly the same thing as you're talking about in uh, in Africa. And indeed, uh, some Dutch developers have put together a, uh, a surf life saving drone which can drop uh, a life ring and also has a little speaker on the drone so they can uh, give some special instructions if they need to remotely as well. And I've even seen uh, in Europe there's um, a drone that uh, delivers defrib uh, cardio defibrillators uh, out into streets. Uh, with a speaker and receiver, so they can instruct the person who's going to apply it out in the field. Mm, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, brilliant. And uh, there are surf life saving drone trials underway right now in, I can't remember if it's either northern New South Wales or Queensland, one or the other. So that same <clears throat> surf life saving principle is being trialled here in Australia. And you're certain to see that because, of course, what it means is that you can have. Uh, you surf lifesavers on the main beach, but with a drone can be effectively patrolling, you know, the next, I don't know, you know, two, three, four, five, six, whatever beaches up and down the, the coastline, uh, both in terms of surveillance and in terms of, as you say, actually getting rescue equipment to people in the water really quickly. So, yeah, look, there's a myriad of things out there. And as I said before, we're just touching on the, the tip of, of, of what is to come. Well, if you don't mind, Peter, I'm going to draw on, on, on Cass's good nature to uh, talk to us again on a regular basis. There's a lot to cover, and uh, I'm looking forward to helping you create a culture and a community that uh, wants to have fun, be productive, make a dollar perhaps, but do it safely so we can all enjoy the sport and the rewards of this amazing new technology. Are you in? Absolutely. Full, fully in, 100%. Love to help. All right, mate. Well, thanks for buckling up this time, Peter. And thanks for answering uh, our listeners and followers' questions. And I'm looking forward to speaking to you again in coming weeks as the Senate reviews our new regulation. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Right there.